Yo, I sound mega nasally in this video because I've got terrible hay fever, which is awful. So uh, go easy on me. Uh, it sucks. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Oh, and shameless plug, subscribe. Why not? All right, <laughs> let's do this. Bye. Ladies and gents, welcome to the video. I'm Get Good Guy. And today I'm going over just how much of a failure Battlefield 5 really has been. Not just bashing on the game. Instead, using actual figures in a way that we simply haven't been able to do until recently. Talking about how things went went wrong and what improvements could be made for the future. Now I played as much BF5 as I could mentally stand for the background footage today and I was doing all of it with a broken controller that constantly looks up in the air so if I don't have enough footage for the whole thing I'll throw up old stuff afterwards, I'm sure you won't mind and I wanted to let you know regardless. Now there is a bit of a long intro to come here, fair warning, as well as a very in-depth video overall. It is necessary today, if that doesn't sound like your sort of thing then so be. It. I'll catch you in a different video, thanks for trying. So while it will take a while to get through all of this, if you're patient today, by the end of the video you'll find that what I've pulled together makes Bashville 5 look really pretty bad and some of these mistakes should never be made again. If you really can't sit through my intro though, I'll put a timestamp on screen now for you to skip to for where I start going through the numbers, but what I see in the intro ahead is of actual importance. So if you don't understand something in the video, that's why. And so, the starting data I'm using for this, which I was sent by Crafter, is manually recorded player number data for BF5. It's available for anyone to access, I'll link to it in the description below for you to check out if you so wish, and he also linked it under his video as well. He sent it to me just after he posted his own video about these findings. I highly recommend checking it out as some of the aspects are different to what I'll cover here today. I'll link to his video in the description below. So, it makes no sense for me to try to avoid the points that he made, because he was absolutely right, meaning that a few bits will just sound like I'm just copying what he said. I don't want to leave them out because as I said he was spot on with them, but I'll be adding a lot more of my own observations and thoughts. You still with me here? <laughs> Good. Just try to be patient as to go through all of this, it'll be worth it if you're interested in the subject matter. Now also a massive shout out to DFK, who collected and shared this data in the first place, he's really the true hero in all of this. And so, let's get up and running. BF5 didn't allow people to get hold of player data, etc via APIs and stuff like that, unlike some previous entries, which is almost never a good sign. And if a game is doing well, companies generally like to shout those numbers out a bit. And this is why we haven't been able to actually track player numbers and analyse them previously. Here is a better look at the chart and data that I'll be referencing in a lot of this video. These numbers are from PC, I believe, but it still shows the basic trend, which is the factor of importance. Basically, the trend on PC will be very similar to the trend on console. It is manually recorded data so it's not 100% spot on but it's very close and it's the best that anyone could have done with DICE not publishing player numbers for this game. It goes from the 1st of January 2019 to the 22nd of January 2019. The data was very regularly recorded for around a quarter of the year. Then after that the checks became basically monthly because I guess the dude got bored or figured there was no need to check so often as the game was already in steep decline. And trust me regardless of why, things have not got better since he stopped gathering the data. So let's look at the 25th of January 2019, not all that long after release. PC player numbers dropped to around 19,000 at its peak for that day. This is a number of significance, as we know from Battlefield Tracker that Battlefield 1 didn't drop to that level until after BF5 released, as Crafter himself pointed out. Of course this goes on to rise and indeed fall a lot, that's the nature of games, but it's a very early precursor for what's to come. I must have had some people at DICE very, very concerned. Now I went through all of this data very carefully and intended to highlight lots of key events to paint the picture, but honestly, it turned out to be less worthwhile than I had imagined in a lot of ways. Not because it didn't tell me anything, it told me a lot, but because it was so overwhelmingly negative, specific points of interest are hard to find. The truth is that BF5 struggled absolutely regardless of updates, events, problems, competing games, whatever. It just continued to flounder, drowning in its own mediocrity. For example, the first week of the Tides of War that we can handily track with this chart saw an increase of week-to-week -week player numbers of 23.88%, an indication of what you'd expect. Content is released and it spikes interest in playing, hence the live service model. All working as intended there, right? But this didn't last long, almost as if people realised really early on that the Tides of War didn't really offer very much. The second week that we can track in the data saw a drop of 10.5%. 
10%. The third week saw a drop of 0.5%. The fourth week saw a drop of 16%. The fifth week saw a drop of 19%, etc. But it could be argued that they were at least stopping the bleeding a bit. Otherwise, it likely would have been even worse. The 21st of March saw a patch with no tides of war. The week to week player numbers difference here was minus 43%. The month to month change overall there was minus 46%. Absolutely staggering drop off. And keep in mind, this was as early as March 2019. Now, this was towards the end of the daily checks for this data, so just imagine how bad it got from this point onwards. In fact, actually, don't just imagine. I'll dive a little bit deeper. I can tell you that multiple of the monthly checks after this point saw player numbers of 10 to 12,000 players worldwide throughout a lot of the year, with high points of around just 17,000. As an eye-opening comparison point, I imagine some of you would like to know what some kind of well-known super successful PC game can pull in. So I went to check CSGO player numbers, and even while Valorant is eating into its player base, one hour ago at the time of recording this audio, CSGO had 769,000 players online. 769,000. So overall, the really low points here in the BF5 data are some of the lowest numbers ever seen for Battlefield, certainly in terms of the modern age of online gaming. And that then paints a sorry picture of the average peak player numbers in their entirety. But I wanted to add extra validity to what I'm presenting and flesh things out further. So this morning, on the day of recording this audio, I checked how many players were playing BF5 on Xbox. I manually added together all of the players actually in lobbies or queuing for lobbies. Now I know this number can be affected by time zones and such like, as North American players will play at different times to Australian players and all that kind of stuff. But it gives us a solid idea. Well, the number of people playing BF5 concurrently Currently, at that time on Xbox was around 2,493. Now, I genuinely put my hand over my mouth when that final calculation came up. I couldn't believe it was actually that low. Sure, the player base for Battlefield on Xbox is, I believe, traditionally the smallest out of Xbox, PlayStation, and PC, but we're still talking about a massive platform. Under 2,500 is absolutely insane to me. Not in one mode, not in Europe, in the entire world world. I mean, the little town where I currently live has more than five times as many people living in it. Combine that data with what we know about PC player numbers and a grim picture is forming. But I wanted to look even deeper. I wanted a further comparison point. So I went and checked the same thing for Battlefield 1 on Xbox straight afterwards. It had around 987 people playing. So thankfully, B5 hasn't dropped below the previous title so far. But how long that lasts for is unclear. As players continue to go back to older titles and new content for BF5 is soon to end. And think about it for a second. BF5, the current Battlefield game at the point of checking, has less than three times as many players as the previous title, which hasn't had new content since the Apocalypse DLC in February 2018. However you might want to try to dress this all up, these are shockingly poor numbers for BF5's image. So this aspect tells us that the game simply didn't entice people to keep playing. Not the core game game offering, nor the live service model. People didn't care about playing weekly for challenges, and many people just bought the stuff the next week or whatever with company coins. Because what else was really on offer? Most of the time, this live service model boiled down to a few challenges for a gun, or a hat, or face paint, or whatever, some kind of playlist for the week which just incorporated what we already had most of the time, and playing to earn XP for other cosmetics. Again, most of them being fairly standard looking skins, or towards the end of the game's active life cycle effectively where we're at at the minute, the Tides of War unlocks were just tier skips for the chapter, making a lot of the offering simply redundant. BF5 is not how you do a live service, trust me. The rewards on offer just aren't enticing enough for most players to overlook the issues with the game's design and implementation. But what was another of their big attempts at grabbing player attention? The Battle Royale mode, joining that hype and releasing Firestorm. But this not only failed, but was a huge waste due to not being free to play, and it simply didn't keep people playing the game for long at all, let alone the fact that it was never truly finished or properly supported. And this isn't a case of people being in Firestorm instead of the recorded multiplayer servers, as it's well documented that Firestorm had a very short active life. But we're going for extra validity here, right? So I took the time to go and do a test for this as well. I searched for a Firestorm solo game, I recorded this process as you can see now. The game itself estimated straight off the bat that it would take 4 minutes and 40 seconds just to 
find the game, so clearly not very populated. Well, it did indeed go to 4 minutes and 40 seconds and then passed it, at which point the game decided to hide the estimate. It went up to around 5 minutes and 5 seconds and then simply failed. Pretty awful, right? Not a good start. So I thought, well, let's be fair, let's try the squad mode and see how that goes. It found me a squad and estimated a game search time at 5 minutes and 2 seconds. Well, it did actually find me a game a little after 2 minutes, which is better, of course, but then I saw that the lobby only had 12 out of 60 players in it, so just 3 squads, and that the game would be starting regardless of how many people were in there in a couple of minutes or so, and in reality the game decided to start the round earlier than that even, with just the 12 players, which is pretty insane for a game that's the current title in a supposedly massive series. But now, let's move on, back to the actual multiplayer. Let's look at what happened around the Pacific expansion. So late October slash early November 2019, when pretty much every creator out there said yes, this is what you need to do, this is the way, use this momentum. Player numbers for this data hit around 45,000 at peak. Oh, and I should have said earlier, by the way, at peak, what I mean is for this data, recording the numbers at 2130 CEST, a supposedly busy time for the game, but regardless, again, it shows us the trend. Now, this number of 45,000 was in tandem with the free-to-play weekend, which of course helps to boost the numbers up, but it was a good sign. And not just that, good business work from DICE and EA. And then DICE made the horrific decision to alter the TTK, or Time to Kill, again. A year after they'd done it before, and it was a complete debacle. This is something I still barely have the words for. Just one of the most incredibly stupid, moronic, asinine decisions I've ever seen in gaming. By the 22nd of December, player numbers at that supposedly peak time were down to around 18,000. The downward spiral was back in effect, ready to mimic exactly what was happening prior to the Pacific update. And now, what, six months later? We know that the game is being cancelled early. So although the figures on the chart don't help us here, as they ended, it doesn't take a genius to work out that we're right back down near the bottom again. Just a shocking turn of events. This also means, by extension, that the initial TTK change in 2018 didn't help player retention, nor inspire a significant amount of people to try the game. And then the next time they did it, it didn't work again, obviously, and even basically pushed the game closer to the grave at a point when they should have been clinging on to the hope of turning it around with the fresh momentum they had. This was always the obvious outcome, yet they did it anyway. Also, as Crafter brought up, the price drops for the game tell us a huge amount. They were absolutely massive, pretty much unprecedented. Even seeing the game drop to half its initial price before Christmas 2018, literal weeks after release. If that doesn't tell you that DICE and or EA were hitting the panic button super early on, then I have no idea what will. Now, have you ever played a game where the big ticket item, the supposed regularly updated aspect of the live service, simply displays a tile that reads, more details coming soon. This is right now. Now, I know this is affected by the coronavirus, and I know that basically new content for this game is coming to a close, but isn't that kind of the point? Regardless of whatever the backstory is, that image pretty much tells the tale of Battlefield 5. While the game is still technically alive, anyone playing the game would be forgiven for thinking otherwise. Or, as this video is predominantly focused upon how the numbers tell the story, let's take a glance at the mode selection screen. Of the 9 listed available modes, how many are actually selectable on a regular basis? 5. Just 5 regular modes. Four of them are temporarily available here and there, yet they still sit there in the server browser all the time. Tell me, what does that communicate to any new player coming to Battlefield 5 who tries to search for those modes? And what does it communicate to them when they go researching why they can't play those modes? And what does it communicate to anyone when they realise that some of those modes were available when the game was released? Nothing good comes of any of this. The main lesson is that a bad core experience can't be papered over with desperate ideas and gameplay shifts, and they certainly can't be fixed if you don't even properly support those ideas. And besides these obvious player number issues, we also saw streamers incorporating Battlefield 1 and such like back into their time, at the expense of Battlefield 5 pretty early on, not throwing BA5 away but reducing their time spent on it. And that only increased over time, Battlefield 1, Battlefield 4. Now Call of Duty Warzone it seems to be a core focus for a lot of Battlefield streamers, and we've seen huge dives in interest 
interest in Battlefield content on YouTube during BF5's life. What I personally thought could be a game to push myself onwards for example, after building my foundations on BF1, just hasn't delivered. I have grown to a solid degree, and can pull in good numbers now, but it's not what you would have imagined. It's not a replica of what happened for people that built their foundation, and then used BF1 to explode. And in fact, knowing how low player numbers have been, and now are, I'm amazed to have had the growth that I have. Between 400 and 600,000 views a month, for 3 months straight right now seems insane, considering what the player numbers are at. And I think a lot of Battlefield creators out there should be almost kind of grateful or, or, or thankful for the viewership they're getting, because I fully would have expected next to no interest by now, considering how low those player numbers are and have been for ages apparently. But how could this have been avoided or at least mitigated? It's important to offer solutions or suggestions as well. Now I'm no game developer, so I can't and shouldn't lay out exactly what to do when it comes to coding the game and all that kind of stuff. I'm not qualified for that. But I have built up a strong understanding of what makes a player base tick and of creative ways to drive a product forward, so I can make suggestions and add relevant speculation. Well, there's of course the really obvious stuff that will get out of the way that's been said so many times, I won't dive into them in any kind of detail. You have to get the tone right, which BF5 did not. You have to form a clear direction for the game, release it in a good state, don't repeatedly mess with how the game plays, don't insult and irritate the community, etc, and give it a fun gameplay loop. Something BF5 is missing for a lot of people. It often goes something like, spawn in, struggle to work out where the enemy are, get shot from random directions where you couldn't possibly pick people out, rinse and repeat. I think a solid outlook for Battlefield now is to focus upon the basics that made BF successful, and then innovate from there. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, just alter it to improve the ride. BF1 was overall very successful, not just for the Battlefield player base, but also from a wider gaming standpoint. It got more eyes back onto the game again. The initial launch trailer was massive, and the game on the whole did very well, at least for large sections of its life. There was no need to create a game that is so nearly the polar opposite of that one in so many ways. Battlefield 4 also ended up doing very well, as did Battlefield 3, but this ever-present theme of releasing Battlefield titles in a poor state and then trying to fix them has to stop. Then, if you have events, make them actually worth playing and feel different. Be creative. Why can't we have fun, original, new temporary ideas? Are people more likely to come back for another week of Bombastic Fantastic, which I think a lot of people don't like and is basically just a playlist of modes we already have, or instead a week of shotguns and snipers only, or infection lobbies, or you know, ju I'm just throwing out ideas, different stuff, original creative stuff, stuff that maybe when someone hasn't played the game for three weeks, they see some completely fresh idea and they're like, let me go on and try that. Or what about the old favourite, simple stuff like double XP weekends and whatever. Do stuff like that fairly regularly, but change it up. It can be simple, but just don't do the same thing over and over again. Now it will be raised that some stuff like that requires a fair amount of work, but so what? Is that not feasible? I already know there's talk within the studio that new talent often doesn't get put where they're supposed to be and aren't utilised properly, so how about fix that? Do you want people to play your game more than they have done or not. And this also means that future games have to have the tech to accommodate multiple modes being on offer or easily transitioning between them. And it needs to be able to make double XP work and whatever else. And have the assignment system work without making the game stutter and all that kind of stuff. Be creative. Make it an actual live service. Or if it's a return to the premium model, you can still have events. Theme the menus a bit for them. Advertise them properly. Do what a development studio is supposed to do. Look at what's being produced by some of your competitors and realise you've fallen behind, way behind. So create real incentives for people to play. Lay out early on if the game is going to be realistic or some fantastical version, not some awkward fluctuating in between. And then make the skins, unlocks and other incentives actually desirable. I still remember the week where the challenger's reward was a red hat. Nobody cares about a red hat. And get better PR, public relations. Hell, even get a PR agency if you can't stop irritating the community. Stop obviously lying and misleading your players. Stop over-promising and under-delivering. Be open, be honest, be approachable, be funny, get involved, lose the fake veneer, have your social media accounts be run by people we can connect with. Don't have it just be Battlefield 5 on Twitter, some faceless thing under a faceless corporation. Innovate and learn from others. Get people with personalities that shine through. Have them run the accounts. Have them state their name at the end of each tweet. Let us know if it's John or Frank or Amanda that said the 
funny thing on the Bashful Five account. People like people, not corporations with messages that come across as forced and manufactured, especially when they feel like they're being lied to or misled, and especially when they feel like core aspects and issues are being ignored, while you press forward to another message about another week with another playlist that no one really cares about. And then use these platforms better. You have how many people following you across social media? Use it. Use it creatively. Interact more. Share more content from creators and community members. Get involved with the community. Put out regular messages on these platforms. Put out regular updates. And make sure your community managers are fully informed, rather than having them deliver messages that then get ripped apart as you hide behind them. They take the brunt of everything while you sit in the studio in your management office and lord it up over your wonderful game that you think so great while your player numbers are in the dirt. And this goes for in-game as well. Throw away the UI ideas from Battlefield 5 and make something good. And then put important things front and center within the game. Updates, patch notes, community discussions, community artwork, creative videos, make the game an actual hub for Battlefield. Get all the stats in there. Fully utilize clans or platoons. Get ahead of your competition rather than producing the bare minimum where it matters while using massive amounts of resources on horrible ideas. And yes, a way to fix that is to change the management massively because BF5 has been taken in the wrong direction again and again and again. Also, if you make a standalone mode, make it free. Don't ram it into the game and expect it to make a difference when it's competing with every other free to play spin off out there Warzone, Fortnite Battle Royale, etc. Be smart, not greedy. And I'm going to go back to that word again creativity. Have actually creative and growth driven external events to drive consumer interest. Actually use and listen to your game changers. And if you don't think some of them are of value, then reevaluate your selection process and bring on board some of the people that have been hypercritical of your game while still being fair and constructive because that will increase your validity and relevance. It will get some of the community on side. They'll see you're making changes and listening and not just pushing people away because they've called out your egregious errors. Then when you have a good group, set up streaming events of recognized players, tie them in with new content, implement their tutorials back into your game, have incentives for people to visit the pages of people streaming your game. Again, actually show some business and creative acumen because you're way off the pace right now. Be different, be brave and be better and consider a dedicated content creation program. Utilize the following you have and tie it in with creators, not just a label like Game Changers or Dice Friends. So this is Dice and EA by the way, and then just have the upper level of those players fly out, get the footage and share it. Sure that works, keep doing it, but so many studios already doing stuff like that. Add to it, have a content creation program and realize how many great aspiring creators are willing to grow through your game that you could lose, perhaps have already lost. Creators that could be an asset to your game moving forward and your game an asset to them. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you for listening. That's my analysis plus my heartfelt suggestions to get this series back on track. And in a perfect world, on top, a lot can be achieved with the right actions, but a lot can also crumble with the wrong ones. I hope you enjoyed. Leaving a like makes a huge difference. Consider subscribing if you're new here for extremely regular content uploads. Let me know what you think in the comments below and all of the links to my social media, including Patreon, can be found in the description and my pinned comment. Here's the board of awesome for the epic people who already support the channel on Patreon. They're all absolute heroes and I love them all deeply and of course often. If you want to join them on the board of awesome, the link to the Patreon page is in the description and my pinned comment. And with all that said, I am Get Good Guy and I'll see you next time. Laters. Battlefield 1 is an obviously beautiful game, a point that barely needs making, one that's been raised an innumerable number of times ever since we got our first glimpse of the game what is now some years ago.